Our featured guest tonight introduced himself to the broader world with the release of his debut film, Unconditional, starring Lynn Collins and Michael Ely, and now brings his talent and skill once again as co-director on the hotly anticipated feature film, Jesus Revolution, starring Kelsey Grammer and Jonathan Rumi. Here to chat about the film and his work is none other than Brent McCorkle. Brent, welcome to the show. It's so good to be on with you, man. Thanks for having me on. So I'd like to uh, learn a little bit about your biography. Where did you grow up and what was life like for you there? Well, I was the pastor's kid. I grew up uh, mainly in Texas. I spent a brief time in Missouri and I loved the snow there. But um, but yeah, my dad wanted to uh, start a church from scratch in Texas. So we left everything that we knew and loved behind in Missouri. And when I was 10, we moved to Texas and started a church with just the four of us, me, my brother, my mom, and my dad. And, um, you know, it was really cool to see what my dad did. He taught me how to chase big dreams. And, um, and so, yeah, I, I got to ride along on it with his big dream and, uh, it turned out really good, man. He's, he's a very beloved pastor and a lot of people still call him pastor after he's been retired uh, from from that for decades. And so, so yeah, it's been really cool. And so uh, I was a creative kid, a little bit adrift, but growing up in the church, it was really cool because they really, a lot of churches really nurture creatives. They really nurture artists. And so I, I was given a safe place to learn how to play piano and sing and be pretty terrible at it to start out with. And then over time, you know, I got better and, um, acted in some dramas, sang in some musicals. And I really, I don't know if you're familiar with any Malcolm Gladwell work, but he, he says, if you, if you want to get good at anything, practice with effort and intensity for 10,000 hours. 10,000 hours. Yeah. From there, I, um, I, I got married. I had kids. I, I, um, got into a career and late in life, again, this kind of a drift artist. I didn't realize how much of an artist I was, but after I switched majors five times, you know, and was married, I realized I wanted to be a filmmaker. I, I'd always loved movies since I was a kid. And so I went to to college here in the Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas area, took some film classes and started making a bunch of short films. And some producers saw me, I'd made about 50 short films at, at that point. So some producers saw one of my shorts in a film festival and they invited me to to be their filmmaker for the movie that you you said at the top unconditional so i moved my whole family similar to my dad moved my whole family to nashville and uh made that movie and that was my first feature and, and from there i i um met john and andy and have had multiple multiple wonderful collaborations with those guys and jesus rev i think being by far the the greatest one so far uh, were there films or certain experiences that made you decide you wanted to pursue cinema as a career? I had an, an awesome experience when I was younger. I tell this story a lot, uh, but uh, my dad, you know, came home with a bootleg. He didn't even know it was a bootleg. It was just given to him by a friend of a friend, but it was a bootleg of Empire Strikes Back and Raiders of the Lost Ark. And if you're an 80s kid, you'll recall that both of those movies took forever to get to VHS. And so I, <laughs> I was one of maybe three kids in America that had those movies on tape. Uh, and my brother and I wore that VHS tape out. We stopped counting when we watched them 40 times each. And, wow. uh, and I've, I've probably seen Raiders and Empire now 60, 60, maybe 80 times. I just, I love those movies so much. And, um, what I was watching though, and marinating on and watching it over and over again were two nearly perfect films. And so I, I think, I think it set the bar high in my brain with me not even knowing it, but yeah, definitely that was the pilot light lighting, you know, igniting. That was, that was definitely the, the ignition point for me was watching those two movies over and over again as a kid. What was the first Christian movie you ever saw? I mean, did you get lucky with something like Ben-Hur, the 10 commandments, or maybe not so much with Bible man, <laughs> like my producer's generation? Yes. Uh, I saw Ben-Hur, as a kid and it blew me away it blew me away it it in, it burned itself into my brain uh what a beautiful movie and it's so great that you would invoke ben hur um and i and i actually i actually brought up ben hur at a symposium like a conference and i never got invited back but but it was all these people going i want to make you know the greatest christian films ever and you know i want to and i was like well how much time have you put into it well you know nothing i was like you need to go watch ben hur and see what's possible because what you're talking about without putting any time into it, it's going to be terrible. 
but like Ben Hur, man, like that is Hollywood bringing all of its forces to bear on a faith based concept. And it is that movie is amazing. I mean, it just stands up, it holds up to the test of time and some of the greatest action sequences, even when they tried to redo it, like you just can't get back there. It's just the most amazing, some of the most amazing, you know, Hollywood at the height of its power cinema ever made. Well, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but uh, when you look at films like this, when you look at um, uh, Jonathan Rumi's other project, The Chosen, when you look at, uh, there's, uh, there seems to be, I don't want to call it a movement, um, but there, there, and you've got uh, studios like Lionsgate, that normally you wouldn't have studios that would get behind uh, faith-based, you know, productions. And do you see that there's maybe being a change in maybe a little bit of the film culture, or are they just recognizing now that there is a profit center in things like this that they didn't recognize before, so they're now willing to make the investment? It's both. It's both simultaneously. So what you have is some the film kids that are slowly growing up, and like I just turned fifty, but over over decades of time, you you beat yourself up, you whip yourself, you want to be better and better and better at every, at every pass. So the people that have stayed in faith that actually care about the quality that actually love Hollywood's bar, those people were, were continuing to get better. You know, so like if you even look at my movies, like they've continued to improve because I'm working actively to do that. And that's one thing I applaud about John and Andy and Dallas Jenkins. Uh, we have this high benchmark of quality in our value system whereas a lot of christian filmmakers don't and that that breaks my heart honestly i think if you're going to attach jesus to something or god you know it better <laughs> it better rock you know it better like destroy <laughs> out there like it better be excellent so other than your own film unconditional what was the first movie of the modern faith-based film era that made you go okay this is different this is actually a good film on its own merits Yes. Oh, man. Um, can I ask you some questions? You know, I guess I was like, what would you for me? It's it's always so dicey to get into this stuff because I have a different take on faith films. So I think there's they're like faith films that are designed to entertain Christians. And then there are films that just grapple with faith and they're they're made for the mainstream, but they have a faith component. So I guess in your mind, which of those? Well, the interesting thing is, is I I had the opportunity to get uh, to, to pre-screen. Jesus Revolution. My, I, I went into that theater thinking it was going to be the latter, thinking that it was going to be a story that was on its own merits that might have a faith-based undertone. And I came out, let's put it this way, it snuck up on me. I, I came out going, you know, oh, wow, this has a much stronger faith component to it. It's still... Here it stood on its own merits, but it also still, I mean, there were three times in the movie where I shed tears. Yeah. Um, awesome. And, 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 uh, and my wife, she shed tears throughout it. Um, she was touched very much by it. So, so it's interesting because I, I see how you're saying there's di this dichotomy between the two. I think, I think your present movie kind of, I think blended it well. Ah oh, man, that makes me so happy. So uh, the reason why I say that is, <clears throat> there are movies uh, that I that are so faith affirming to me, but so, are offensive to others because like, well, that's not Christian entertainment. That's that that doesn't affirm my faith. But like, so uh, M Night Shyamalan uh, signs, I'm very moved by the faith story in that. Uh, there's a little indie movie that Ryan Gosling did called Lars and the Real Girl, where he's mentally ill and the community comes around him and tries to help him, and they actually have the thematic discussion of the film takes place in a church and literally the priest asks, well, what would Jesus do? And then they just get around this guy and start loving him. And that's just a mainstream indie movie. So there are movies like that, that I really applaud because I think it's, it's hard maybe in Hollywood to, to Brit, to do a faith, uh, um, you know, a faith adjacent uh, storyline. Um, and then, but then you have like on, on the on other side of the spectrum, you have films that are, made for the church right and so so what's interesting with john and i uh is we're different and my it was really cool directing this because we made the same movie we were totally on the same page but i think our hearts are go out to two different audiences and 
So I think you, I think we might've threaded the needle on this one. Like my stuff, I just, I want it to go out to the mainstream. I want the atheists to watch it and cry. And I, I want the hardcore entrenched evangelicals, you know, to watch it cry and everybody in between, because I do think there are universal themes. And I think God's love is trying to get to us in a myriad of different ways. And I don't think that necessarily always has to be through preaching. Uh, but at the same time, John really has a heart for this underserved entertainment market, which is the Christians, because they have been, they have been underserved from Hollywood, let's be honest, you know, and I think that might be changing and, and, um, and I really hope that it is, but together, I think we threaded this needle perhaps. <laughs>